Uh, my name is Nate Gagne, and I'm one of the pastors at Restoration Church, and I'm really glad that we get to be here together to worship the Lord together, to hear testimonies together, to open the Bible together, and uh, it is a great thing. It's a great thing to hear the preaching of God's Word, and not everybody understands that or knows that. We talked a few weeks ago about how we are involved in natural and supernatural things, and if, we, and if we're paying attention, they can be simultaneous. And the preaching of God's word is a natural and supernatural experience. You can think back to Jesus, and you may have heard him, you may be familiar with his saying, he, he would say, he who has ears, let him hear. And he's not just saying like, um, you know, if you have ears, use them. What he's, what he's talking about is, if you've got your spiritual ears open and listening, then you'll hear beyond just the story, and you'll hear God's truth in that. And that is something that happens every week. As we are in this series called, uh, this series about test, and the type of test God brings us, brings us through, I don't just want you to hear what I'm talking about, I don't just you want you to hear my stories or the examples or the quotes or even just uh, hear the Bible verses, but I want you to listen spiritually that within the, the deepest parts of your soul, you will hear and recognize God's truth for you. Now, I want to share with you another testimony from our family's life and our boys Kingdom Builders project this year has been raising and selling beef and pork. And we, they were invited to an event a couple weeks ago, and I shared with you that people bought them cows and to help them in their project. And so we added, we, we added uh, cows that week, We've, or some more cows are coming, and so we'll have, oh, we'll have 20 cows, I think, at our house, some of them showing up pregnant. And, um, and which is a great thing. It was a great blessing to us and ju- definitely an inspiration to the boys as they recognize, as they put God first, he, and for all of us to recognize as we're, if we're jumping into what God wants and God wants us to build his kingdom, then he is going to supernaturally provide for us to be able to do more than we could do on our own. That's so why Kingdom Builder season, we talked to you about having a plan, a vision, and a dream. Have a plan of what you can give. You know, if I don't buy, you know, if I make my own coffee or if I pack my own lunch, then I can give this much per month. Having a vision uh, and hearing what does God want to give through you, and then it's not what you can do on your own, but you need God to help you and sustain you in order to accomplish that. And He has, He wants to bring you on that journey. And then the last thing is to have a dream. And that's kind of it could be a wild number, and these are numbers that we really just keep to ourselves and our family, but they are, they are not something that we could ever do, and, and sometimes it may be 10 years down the road, but to have that dream. And so I was excited that my boys got to be a part of that, that they had a plan and they had a vision, they accomplished that vision, and then they've got some dreams and God's able to backfill it in a supernatural way. So anyway, I told you that day that there were some other testimonies that we were told were going to happen, but we, I would tell you about them if they happened. And one of them happened. One of them happened this past week. And they had told us, because they gave us all these new cows, which is a lot of food and hay, and it, it, it would be quite an expense for them to just throw on us. And we were told that they were going to pay for the food for all of these additional cows that they got us, and we did get a check in the mail from WorldServe this week that they did send us a five-digit te- check to pay for, uh, for all their food and hay for the next year. So I just wanted to share that with you. It just goes, you know, the old adage, you can't outgive God, um, which we've, my family's been trying to see what the ending limits of that is. Since, uh, d- since God challenged me with that in 2013, and he has given us far more than we've given him. And just when we think that the tails are skipping, the scales are tipping in our favor, that, hey, God, I think we actually outgave you this time, then he does something like that. Um, and it's amazing. 
I'm going to, I'll check back in on that with you in a second, but this is the second week of our series, and we're talking about tests that God puts us through, and this week is the motive test, the motive check. Our theme verse for this series is in Proverbs 17, verse number three, and it says, fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And this is the idea of this, that the type of test that God puts us through, it's not like finals, it's not like you know, God being a jerk, but he's putting us through these different types of tests to see if our heart is really connected to him. He's also, these tests help to grow us, they help to strengthen us, they help to qualify us, that we are truly one of his followers. We're not just people who call ourselves Christian because it is you know, within our neighborhood or our workplace, like it helps to give us some sort of status or helps us to fit in or helps take pressure off of us, but we're actually following him because we love him and we've given him our life. Now, something else to add in that I didn't say last week is that when God um, puts us through these tests, there's a, there's a benefit for him, but there's also a benefit for us. And that is that when God puts us through these tests, it's for our own peace of mind. And I know some of you are like, I don't want God to test me. That scares me. What if I pass it? What if I do it wrong? How will I know? And we, get, we can be anxious about it. But it, these, when, when, when this happens to us, the test of small things, the motive test, the other ones that we'll talk about in these series, these are something we can look forward to because many people, as a pastor, I've experienced many people, and I've had to counsel many people this way over the years, they are not sure if they are really followers of Jesus. And there can be different reasons for that. One of the most common is they, people struggle with their past, and they can't believe that God has forgiven them. And so they wrestle with that. Pastor, I, you know, how do I know God's really forgiven me? How do I, I've done, if you even knew half of the bad things I've done, I, I just don't think, and they try to keep them, they try to live in a state of punishment, purposely punishing themselves, purposely keeping God at a distance because they just can't believe that God would just forgive them because they asked. And when we go through these tests, passing these tests assures us we belong. Just lets us know, no, I am a follower of his. There's a, you know, there's a question that maybe you've thought about before. When someone gives up their life in order to in order to stay faithful with Jesus, so they become a martyr. You need to deny Jesus as Lord, or else we'll end your life, and they may, I will not deny Jesus, and so their life is ended. We can look and say, well, I think I would have the courage to do that, but we don't know unless we were to stand in that spot, but all of these other little tests show us, like, no, I will, I will follow God no matter what. I will... Obey God no matter what. I will walk with God through anything. And even though they're little tests, they help build our faith. They help us to know that we're not following him because it's convenient. We're following him because he is Lord. Now, as we talk about the motive test, as my family, as we give... One of the things we have conversations about is to make sure our motives are right. And so the boys had gotten invited to Missouri and they were guests of honor and and um, and our conversations were before guys. Why are you giving? This is why we're giving. Okay, you're going to be honored here, but it is not about the honor. You're, you, they're going to pull you up on stage. People are going to clap for you. But you've got to remember, it's not about that. And we're talking and teaching them through their own motives. And I'm talking and teaching myself also through these own motives. 
to recognize and remember why we are giving and to never forget that. It's an important thing. Right? What are we doing? We're, we're trying to make sure we pass the motive test. Now, I share openly with you um, about what my family gives, you know, our tithing, our Kingdom Builders goals, the things we've accomplished about Kingdom Builders. And I want to share with you a scripture that uh, potentially is showing that I've done something in huge error. All right. So you may have heard this verse and we're going to look it up for you. It's in Matthew, Matthew chapter six. And you can go ahead and turn there even as I read the scripture, because we'll be in Matthew chapter six, this message. But the scripture, and this is Jesus teaching in verse number three, he says, when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And certainly, as I've stood before you and before the church, there's been times when I've said, hey, this is what we did last year. This is a percentage of our household income that we've gave. This is our goal to give this year. Hey, we accomplished the goal that we said we were going to give, and I've done that to you. And the, the question that we'll, we'll look at is, one, was that, am I wrong to do that at all? And, and the answer to that is about motive. It is about motive. And you can't, and here's a big thing that's going to free you. you. You are not the person to judge another person's motives or intentions. You cannot do that. There's no way for you to understand and know that. So the big thing for all of us is to stop determining what another person's motives or intentions are. But the thing we can judge and the thing we can evaluate is their fruit and is their actions. This is something that if we judged less on intention and more on action, we would be, uh, we would be free. You probably would have been uh, saved yourself from five or ten bad dating relationships if you judged based on the fruit of their life and less on their intentions. You would have ended a lot of relationships sooner if you were judging based on their actions and not on their intentions. This is something that we, but God, because he's perfect, because he knows you, because he knows me, we cannot hide our intentions from him. Now, Matthew chapter six, which is the verse that you're opened up to. Matthew chapter six, this is the hometown of the hypocrite. Matthew chapter 6, this is where the hypocrites live. Because he's giving us three different examples of people who are acting godly and showing and posturing themselves as godly, but they are failing the motive test. Every single one of them. I just talked about giving. And he's saying, hey, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is giving. We, you know, when you're giving to the poor, you shouldn't be shouting and telling people that. And there's this question, who are you trying to impress? If we're giving to help people, why are you trying to impress people? The second thing here in Matthew chapter 6 is about prayer. When you pray... Don't be like hypocrites, for they love to stand praying in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And it's a motive to, when you're praying, who are you trying to impress? Or you, who are you, whose attention are you trying to gain? And this is something to, you know, to be very aware of. Teenagers, listen to me for a second, all right? And, and you're not the only ones who do this, but... Um, but when you go to summer camp and people are at the front of, uh, of the auditorium and they're worshiping the Lord, you'll feel a temptation to, I want to raise my hand so that guy sees me. I want to raise my hand so that girl sees me, right? And it has nothing to do with God. You're not trying to gain the attention of God. You're trying to gain the attention of someone else in the room. W listen, we do that. We do that. All right. People in the room do that. On Sunday mornings, we do that. Sometimes if someone comes in and they have, their motive is, is nefarious, their motive is demonic, what they'll try to do is posture themselves as spiritual. 
Because if they walk in and say, hey, I, you know, got, Satan has sent me in here to divide and destroy your church, hopefully you'd be smart enough not to follow them. So the, so the enemy doesn't work that way. So what does he do? He walks in and gets people to shout and gets people to build a crowd, get people to raise their hands. And then they suddenly begin to say, I'm just not sure the pastoral staff is as spiritual as I am. And they ask a question similar to that. All right, a little bit more. Get you like, oh. And then they begin to ask, and they begin to now posture themselves as the most spiritual person in the room. I'll tell you what, the most spiritual people in the room are the most humble people in the room. And they're never drawing attention to themselves, they're always drawing attention to Jesus. And they're never trying to divide, they're always trying to encourage, they're always trying to build up. So when someone begins, who you say, this is my spiritual hero, but they begin to act in a way contrary to, contrary to scripture, you begin to say, oh, wait a minute, I think they're failing the motive test. And you judge their actions, not their intentions, and you begin to see their actions here are ungodly. Their actions here are to divide. Their actions here are to create... Um, um, fighting. So giving, praying, and the last one is fasting. And the instruction here is when you fast um, to, you, you know, what they would, the culture at the time is when you'd fast, you would really dress it up. So when you're fasting, you're going to make sure your posture looks like you're fasting and you dress like you are fasting and you'd pull your hair down like you're fasting. So everybody would say, wow, that, per- wow, they are so spiritual. They are so close to God. Wow. And again, what was the same thing? The question is, the question for us is how spiritual are you trying to appear? And it's easy to appear spiritual. Dress up nicer than the rest of the people. Have a bigger Bible. Even look down on other people's translations of the Bible. Oh, New Living Translation. It's KJV for me. I, oh, KJ for you, KJV for you. Oh, look at mine is Greek. I read straight from the Greek. You're, and you're trying to just show your more spiritual so when you raise your hands, when you lift your voice, it has nothing to do with trying to get the attention of God. It's trying to appear more spiritual than other people in the room. God wants none of that. He's not convinced by any of that. Um, and, I, I, and, and maybe there's only one person in the whole church that needs to be coached like this, like the way 20-year-old Nate Gagney should have been coached like this, the response is not to deliberately look unspiritual, which is how I used to respond. One of my, one of my friends, when he, uh, he worked at a church, and he, uh, during communion one Sunday, he took out peanut butter, and he put it on his communion bread and ate the communion, and he, he was trying a little bit too hard to just come against that communion is something, um, something different than it is. And I, I, I try to do that a lot. You don't have to do that. We don't have to show that, again, we don't have to repent, just be who God's called you to be, just respond to God, just be authentic before God, just be obedient before God. And we don't have to worry in our church about being different than another church. And they don't, they, and they don't, we don't have to worry if people are concerned that we're different than them. What we need to be concerned about is God's word, obedient to the assignment God's given us. Uh, we need to be concerned about the Great Commission, which is just one more. It's how we verbalize it here to help remember it. We need to be concerned about our heart, our soul. Are we following God? And we don't need to be concerned about, about anything else. They'll save you from a lot of Facebook drama as well. <laughs> we don't know what their intentions or their motives are. We don't know. God does. Giving, praying, and fasting to places to be ungodly while looking godly. 
Three places, I say two. So Dr. Tim Elmore, who wrote a devotional called Habitudes, which is where we've taken these seven tests out of, he says, why we do something will ultimately determine what we do. The motive check, the motive check. And let, let, me, let me share one example that's not in my notes, but, but I almost put it in. I guess I should have. Why we do something will ultimately determine what we do. I feel like the motive test uh, appears in a lot of marriages. It appears in a lot of marriages. And, and it's actually taught, I've heard it taught within Christianity and within, um, within like Christian marriage conferences that bad motives would produce good results. And this is obviously not true. And here's what I've heard. And so, you, you know, teenagers, you can hopefully learn from this, but, but it's about to get awkward. So <laughs> here's, here's, here's what you've heard. Husbands, if you want to turn your wife on, do the dishes. Vacuum, mop. That way you'll have more intimacy. That's how you'll, you know, she'll repay you in the bedroom because you've done the dishes. Now, I don't know what the wives here in the room are, but I think they're smart enough to know your motives. And I don't think that motives, I don't think that, that doing the dishes or doing chores with the motive of scamming your wife or doing some sort of trade-off gets, any, gets you anything. Because our motives determine what we do, right? And if our motives, if we're like, hey, I'm serving you, <laughs> wink, wink, because I'm expecting you to serve me later, that does not create what you need to create. And some of you are so mad and you're in that part, that intimacy in your relationship is so broken because you think, I'm doing all these things for you, but you've got to recognize you're not doing anything for them. And they see what your true motives really are. And you, if we're going to serve our spouse, then we need to truly serve them. And obviously, we could flip this to, to, for the other spouse as well in other areas. You've got to just recognize. And, and it maybe would just be helpful in your relationship to say, oh, you're doing the dishes. Yeah, I'm doing the dishes. <laughs> and this is what I'm hoping and praying will happen. All right, just be honest, and maybe they'd appreciate your honesty <laughs> rather than you lying to them. So what is our response on this? What do we do? How do we pass the motive check? So some things we'll see in Matthew chapter 6 will also be in Job and Philippians here in a moment. But here are some things you need to do to pass the motive check. Number one, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. And it's not going to start beyond there. You can come to church and dress up and carry a Bible and raise your hands and have all the answers to the Bible questions and shout amen. And you can do everything externally, but there's nothing external that gets us to heaven. There's no re amount of religious activity that makes up for our sin. There's no amount of religious activity that gets us on Jesus' radar and says, hey, let's make an exception for this guy. He didn't follow me, but he was really pretty good. He, it, it, nothing. It comes with following Jesus. That is the starting place for everything spiritual in our life. Jesus, I'm following you. I'm not following a doctrine. I'm not following a, a, a church leader. I'm not following culture. Jesus, I'm following you. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 6 again. And let's read verses 5 and 6. It says, when you pray, this is Jesus, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pay, pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. 
That is all the reward they will ever get. So stop right there. When you pray to impress others, that's the only thing you're going to get. That's the, God's not listening to that prayer. He's not moving heaven. He's not sending out angels. He's not, he, 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 that's it. The attention you get in that room or the attention you get from that person is the only reward you will ever get. And Jesus says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will, will reward you. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. The, the point here is not that other people should never know you pray. Or that our church, we should be, you know, you know never raise our hands and, and never pray out loud. That's not the point. The point is to have a relationship with Jesus. That you're, you know, what's going on behind closed doors? I'm spending time with Jesus. I talk with him. I talk with his father. I have a relationship with them. I, I listen to them. I spend time with them. That's what he's saying here. Have a relationship first. Have a relationship only, like if, if there's only one thing you can have, have a relationship with him. Have a relationship with him. Now, in my relationship with my wife, if you pay attention, if you pay attention, honestly, I can look like a pretty, dad, pretty bad husband, a pretty bad dad, because if you go on Facebook, I hardly ever say happy Mother's Day to my wife on Mother's Day. I don't. Sometimes if I do make a Valentine's Day post, I'll like do it the next day or do it at midnight. Happy Son's Day. They've already got their reward on their dad. They, I hardly ever post on that stuff. And it could look like, oh my word, poor Michelle. Her husband doesn't post. But I, listen, if she had to choose between being the husband I am to her the rest of the year or having a Facebook post. Because certainly, and I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but we've all seen Facebook posts from people and you know they hate each other. Right? So what do we want? Do we want the outward or do we want the behind the closed doors? Who is it really? Michelle, she's here in the front row. Which would you rather have? Both. Well, So again, in your relationship with Jesus, what's going on behind closed doors for you? Here's the next thing. <laughs> Pursue Jesus and not his benefits. Pursue Jesus and not his benefits. Famous, the, 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 the most studied and probably misunderstood, but, but uh, an entire book of the Bible is talking about the life of Job. And we're not going to go into all the theological intricacies of this, but I want to read to you Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. This is a conversation between Satan and God. We don't believe that this is a parable. We believe that this is an account of a true story. And so here's what happens in verse number 9. Satan replies to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. So let's Talk about, just to give a little bit background story, you may not be familiar with Job is. Job was the guy who served God. And he was immensely blessed by God. If he were here in the room, we would all, right, this guy has more than all of us. He probably had more than all of us combined. He was immensely wealthy, immensely blessed. His life was very, very good. And Satan's challenging God on this. Yeah, he, he follows you. But of course he follows you. Look at every good thing he has in his life. So continue to the next verse. He says, you've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. 
but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to his face. And so Satan's challenging God on Job's motives. His motives aren't actually for you, God. He just figured out that you're where the wealth is. He's figured out that if he acknowledges you, then he can have everything he wants. Take it all away, and you know what's going to happen? He'll be cursing you as much as Kit. Well, he'll be cursing you as much. Who swears a lot in their music as much as Nicki Minaj? <laughs> or King's Kaleidoscope. Uh, So this, the end of the story is God took everything and Job never cursed him, not once. He didn't understand, he wasn't happy, it was not easy, he was broken, he was mourning, but he followed God. And we have a motive test because we are blessed. We are richer than the majority of the world. Our teenagers, when we shared about this a few weeks ago, they were the richest people in that church we were at that day. But if it was taken away, would you still follow? If it was taken away, would you still believe? And Job did, and he was, everything was restored. And God was showing him, and he was showing, he was showing Satan, he was showing Satan, he was showing us, that those who follow me, they're going to follow me. And may we never go through a test like that, but if we do, what is our motive? Pursue him, church. Don't pursue his benefits. He has benefits for us. Oh, does he have benefits for us? But pursue him first. And just a little, can I, we, can I break off this and give some fatherly dating advice? Would you be open to that? This is a surprising benefit of sexual purity. Because when you're not fooling around with each other, but you're maintaining purity in your dating relationship until marriage, then you walk into that marriage knowing this person actually loves me for me. It's a surprising strength and a benefit to even your dating relationship. You're not really, you're concerned about them having cheated on you or cheating on you. I mean, it is just, it becomes a great foundation pillar to your relationship. Let's talk, let, you know, and I just let me be a dad there for a second for you. Here's the last thing in band, you guys can come up. It is to know your own motivations. There are scriptures, God search my heart, created me a clean heart. God search, and see if there's any anxious thought within me. There's Scripture is telling us to evaluate ourselves, to investigate ourselves, to ask God to investigate ourselves um, because we want to make sure that there's nothing between us and him. You've got to know your motivations. Why are you really doing something? Why are you really raising your hands at summer camp? Why are you really bringing your Bible to church? And please bring your Bible to church. Why are you really doing these things? Why are you really serving? Why are you really tithing? Is it because you, are, you have a relationship with Jesus? Is it because you're pursuing him? Or is it because you have another motivation? Now, we are not perfect people, and what can happen is we have wrong motivations and right motivations simultaneously. And we don't want to pretend that that's not happening. But let me read you this scripture, which has unfortunately been a life verse for me. Philippians 2 verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. <laughs> Pray that all the time. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Another scripture 
Or that same verse in another translation says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, many of us are ambitious people. If you're a business owner, you're ambitious. As a pastor, I'm ambitious. But ambition is not a bad thing. Selfish ambition is a bad thing. Um, there's a guy in history, Salmon P. Chase. He was born in Cornish, New Hampshire. He graduated from Dartmouth, and he found himself on Abraham Lincoln's cabinet as head of the treasury. He was, it, it, it is his face that's on the $10,000 bill, if you ever want to put one of those in the offering. He is, uh, he's an unknown guy, but, but yet he was a big part of our, is a big part of how we were able to win the Civil War, actually. He was, an, he was a selfishly ambitious guy. And Abraham Lincoln knew of it and his cabinet knew of it, but while he was serving Abraham Lincoln, he was also cultivating and created creative following so he could run for president at Abraham Lincoln's second term. He wanted to go up against his leader and uh, go, and, and go up against Abraham Lincoln and keep Abraham Lincoln from running a second term or from, yeah, from serving a second term. Eventually it didn't happen. It kind of all fell through and Abraham Lincoln knew it along, which is kind of the, one of the amazing features of his life that he let even those who were in opposition of him serve with him for the good of the country. But he had a letter written to him uh, there was a, a lady that he had built friendship with, and, and so they would write letters every once in a while. And in one of her letters, she said this to him. She says, ambition makes us the God of our own idolatry. Another scripture, uh, another quote about Sam and P. Chase uh, that someone else wrote about him is the only problem with Chase is that theologically he thinks there are four people in the Trinity. And what that meant was he considered himself next to God. And his selfish ambition, even though he made great contributions, his selfish ambition is one of the things we most recognize him for and remember him for. How he was always trying to posture himself above people and put himself above people, thinking himself above people, as opposed to Abraham Lincoln, whose name you know, who continually served set aside what was best for him to serve his country and to help his country. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And here's what I do, and I've told many of you guys this in counseling sessions. I have ambition, I have ambition that tends to be selfish. And I just, I'm just honest with God. And so when I pray, I'll pray, God, I just pray for the church. I pray, I pray for the church to grow. I pray for the church to grow. I want to reach just one more. The testimonies we had, 18 water baptisms last week. God, you know, give us hundreds more. And there's a pure motivation in that because Jesus changed my life and I want him to change yours. I was 14 years old. And I'd gone to church my whole life, but I was 14 years old and he changed my life. And I want everyone, everyone to experience that because I know what it did for me and I want you to experience it. But there's selfish ambition in that prayer as well that I have to talk with God about. God, if I, you know, if the church, is, if the church grows, then the people who think that, the people who think that my church isn't spiritual enough, the people who left the church, I'll show them they shouldn't have left got my selfish ambition that if the church grows, then my, then my peers will, will recognize that I've accomplished something and they'll, and they, and they would ask me for help and they seek my advice and I, and there's selfish ambition in that. And so what I do is I just say, God, here are my true, here, here's the, as I pray this prayer, here's what I want, here's what I'm asking, but also I just want you to know that this is the nasty part of me and this is in here as well and I recognize it's there. I pray you'd crucify that part of me 
but I just want you to know I know it and I'm not trying to hide it from you. God, I pray this for my kids and, and, I, and I want this for their life, but also here's the selfish ambition part. God, if they accomplish this, then I'll feel validated. And, and so God, crucify that part of me. God, in my marriage, um, you, you know, here's, here's the parts I pray for my marriage, but also here's the selfish parts. I pray you crucify that in me. And that to me has been the greatest tool that I've used in my own life to, to, um, to deal with that part of my life. And I think God, it will be a great tool for you as well. Listen, let me pray. Jesus, we love you. And we want relationship with you first and over everything. Jesus, we love you so much. I ask God that every single person in here that we would meet you and we would follow you. We wouldn't follow, we wouldn't follow anything but you and your word. Not our preferences, not our styles, not our own ambitions, we'd follow you. May we know you, may we spend time with you. And God, you, I just pray for every single one of us, reveal the selfish ambitions and the wrong motivations in our heart. That we can repent of those things, that we could confess those things, and we could follow you in freedom from those things. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today. If you want to learn more, subscribe, like, or check out one of our locations. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.